All right, this week we have Ryan Harrison on the podcast and we are talking vision. Yeah, it's not mechanics. It's not arguing on Twitter about lead elbow or the back scap. We're talking vision. We're talking about things that, that really move the needle. Um, and, and in all seriousness, vision is something that I think is a low-hanging fruit in player development. And people like Ryan are doing a great job of, of working with players, getting the information out there. And so I hope by bringing Ryan on the podcast, you're going to be able to to help more players out and and just if anything else, just open your open your eyes as to ways to be creative to help players improve their vision. So here we go with Ryan Harrison. All right, we now welcome onto the podcast Ryan Harrison. Ryan, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks, Patrick, for having me. So I, I got a question for you. Recently, I was talking to a couple of different, uh, couple of different guys in baseball. We were talking about day games. We were talking about night games. And uh, Josh Hamilton's name was brought up. And I, I remember back in the day, you know, they were saying because he has blue eyes, it was it was harder for him to see during the day. And so I'm curious: a, is that true from what you've seen? And then b, is there certain color eyes better at night versus in the day, or is that just all anecdotal? Uh, you know, it's a good question. Um, in, in all honesty, yeah, there is a difference. Um, but is that the reason? Probably not. Um, you know, it's it can be used as an excuse, uh, but there are people who are more light sensitive, and he definitely could have been more light sensitive than the average person. But it's not always just because they have light colored eyes. The tendency is someone with light color eyes might be more light sensitive, but um, you know. In all honesty, um, the the reality is it's probably not bright enough to cause a problem, and usually it's more of an attentional issue than a sense light sensitivity issue. But if it was a light sensitivity issue, you know, there's contact lenses that um, will can can you know you can use like sunglasses in a sense, uh, which may, were made famous by Nike, um, or you can do sunglasses too. You know, obviously Oakley. Uh, any other brand, good quality brand that has a good lens that is going to help, you know, with some of that brightness. Now, just to kind of add to that, just for your for listeners, is everyone thinks putting a dark lens on is what's going to, you know, help them. And a lot of times that's not the right color lens that they should be putting on. Uh, they should be putting on more of a uh, maybe a orangish tent, tent or a reddish tent. Uh, lens on there just to cut the glare enough or cut the uh, the color enough that they can still see. But sometimes the too dark a lens is not not very good as well. Mm, that's interesting. What about hitters uh, wearing sunglasses when they hit? Have you worked with players who that's helped more or was that not as much? Uh, it, you know, again, it's personal choice, uh, you know, to what people want. Um, there are a lot of people that put glasses on and there's no way they're ever going to hit in it. Because, um, you know, there's, you know, it just becomes a bothersome and, and, you know, it's just like anything you try new, it could be shoes, it could be a glove, it could be a bat, you're going to find if you don't like it, it's, it's not going to work for you, right, you got to have some comfort level into it. So there's some players that doesn't bother and it, there's a comfort level to wearing it. There are some issues with cheap lenses that might not have good quality um, uh, optics in it. Um, you know, this kind of goes into prescription glasses too. I mean, wearing prescription glasses, obviously Oakley's made it popular to wear uh, prescription glasses compared to the old uh, Rec Specs is what they used to wear. Chris Sabo, think, speaking of Cincinnati uh, a while back. Um, but, um, you, you know, contact lenses are really a, a better fit for those situations. But from a sunglass standpoint with the colored lenses, it's not easy to pop on and pop off. So glasses, Due to lighting conditions, you can change anytime you want to. Ryan, what would you say a, a, a good way for a coach to, and I've heard you say, you know, figure out how players perceive the world. I, I liked how I, oh, I was listening to you on another podcast, and I, you, that was one of the things you said that I liked is trying to figure out how, how players perceive the world. What would be a, a, a way that coaches could figure that out in a team setting? Um, you know, obviously uh, – <laughs> that's kind of a tough question because 
you're talking about an individual and how they perceive, and then you ask about a team situation, right? So, you you know, a team, uh, trying to get a team to understand what they see versus what a player understands what they see could be a little bit different, but a lot of it is asking questions more on the individual side. Uh, what are they looking at? Where are they looking at? And what, and how are they looking? Um, what makes sense to them? What doesn't make sense to them? Um, but from a team situation, you know, doing drills that have to do with, um, you know, perception of in and out versus, you know, up and down of pitches from a hitting standpoint, uh, asking questions like, where did you think you saw that ball? Um, you know, how early did you pick it up? How late did you pick it up? Uh, did you know think it was up the middle? Did you think it was to the side? You know, just kind of asking lots of questions to try to figure out how people perceive the information is really um you know, one way as as a coach, that is easy. Now, on the other side of it, there are, let's say, visual skills that how the eyes function can can make someone perceive something differently, uh, including height judgment, but also in and out. Some people see things closer to them than it actually is. Some people see things further away than it actually is. So there are some testing things that can be done at an inexpensive coach world. Doesn't have to be an optometrist, doesn't have to be a sports vision expert, that they can kind of do quick tests to kind of see how their eyes aim um, and and then how they, it, it helps understand how they perceive that information. Gotcha. Yeah, when I was saying a team setting, I, I guess I was just – I was thinking of all the coaches who – you know, high school coaches anyway, who like, you know, they're limited on time and space and they, um, I guess that's, that's kind of where my mind was going. I, I didn't, I wasn't trying to, uh, to set you up to fail there when you're answering that question. Um, but I can definitely I mean, see it, where it's confusing. <laughs> well, the, you know, the thing about vision that people, you know, it's, it's not real simple, but it is simple. You know, we all think it's just about where they look. Uh, are you, are you looking at the ball? Yes. Yes or no. But it's really, um, how they intake that visual information and how accurately they intake that information. If, you know, just, you know, in a, you know, in a quick way of trying to say this, some people have sharper vision than others, right? There's a clarity issue. So how they perceive that in information based off their clarity could be a huge difference. Uh, perception of how they use one eye versus two eyes, but or if they're using their right eye or using their left eye, they can perceive information differently. And then again, some can aim closer than others. Some can aim further away. Some can understand heights a little bit differently. Um, and also, you know, understand where they aim at. So, you know, again, from a team situation, you know, a simple thing, and this is a no-brainer, but let's let's talk about from a hitting drill, is just asking them a quick question is, what part of the ball are they looking at? And a lot of times they have no idea what they're looking at. They're just kind of generally looking. And by aiming small, missing small could be a huge difference. Look at the upper part of the ball. Look at the lower part of the ball. We're not talking about hitting that part. We're just talking about looking at it and just kind of see how they perceive the information by the way they're looking at, at the ball, their target a little differently. Mm, yeah. So one of the things I, I did want to ask you about is, on deck, right? You see some different players on deck routines. Um, I, I know like one of the things that I actually put out in my email a few weeks ago when I was talking about vision is um, your your 3D depth stickers, actually. And um, what's a like, what's the thought behind behind that? Just from maybe like a technical point of view, like I'm just kind of curious. And then also, is there any other tips or tricks for on the on deck circle, should players be looking further away and then back in? Like, what are some of the things that that you've seen help players um, kind of prime their vision right before they they go to the um, step up to the plate? Yeah, well, um, you know, the general thing people say is just you know watch the pitcher, time the pitcher, and uh, I'm not saying that's wrong, uh, but it, that's it's a very simplistic view of it, and. Um, you know, to be successful um, as a hitter, hitters like to be calm, confident, focused on their task, right? And so finding a way to do that in the on-deck circle as they take it up to the box is, is key. And I do think every player has their own way of doing it. And sometimes it's trickery. 
you know, maybe tap your left foot twice and then tap your right foot might give you enough confidence to to be able to focus on the task at hand. Uh, some guys like to do, you know, breathing stuff. Maybe that's enough to to get you to focus on the task at hand. And some guys like to do visual stuff. They like to make sure their eyes are primed. And so, you know, you mentioned the switching back and forth. It's it's not going to hurt them. Uh, it's not going to, um, you know, not get them ready. But it's a, it, it is a simple way that they can move their eyes and bounce their eyes back and forth. Now, that can be far to near. It could be side to side. It could be toe to toe. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can make eye movements uh, to basically calm your calm your mind. And, you know, even to uh, kind of sidestep here, there is a psychology uh, uh, um, field called EMDR, which is eye movement disassociation retraining. I think that's what it stands for. And it has to do with a lot of eye movements to calm the amygdala down, uh, which is kind of the fear part of the brain. So learning how to control your eyes and control the amygdala can help calm people down and be focused on the task. But you know, there are some exercises you mentioned the targets on there, and those are something that uh, my father designed years ago for something easy for players to be able to use. And it's more than just, you know, utilizing these targets. It's how they uh, focus using those targets. And some guys are better than others, even though they claim they use it. Um, but what happens is they're getting the brain to use both eyes, turning the both eyes on and getting the brain to calm down. And when they have that brain in that calm state and their eyes are turned on, it's a good state for them to be in. So a lot of guys find that as a tool um, after they use it for training their eye muscles, they'll use it as a tool in the on-deck circle or it, um, actually in the dugout, sometimes pregame, sometimes uh, in-game, and take it on on the field. So, you know, you may see that referenced. Uh, you you mentioned a uh, uh, player with the Cubs, Ian Happ. There was a video that was um done at spring training where he's looking at his his stickers inside his helmet before he um goes to the plate so it's it's a method that he's got a routine that he's got to get his eyes primed and ready to go when he goes to the plate you had mentioned that there's there's players who use that um just as they're training so how how would they go about doing that is that you're using the sticker maybe you're you're putting it further away like eight ten feet away and you're looking at it that way or how do they go okay. about doing that in training <laughs> The training it needs to, to, to not really explain all how you're doing the training, but what you're doing, uh, first of all, um, the the brain uh, is, you know, the eyes are part of the brain, and there actually is seven muscles in each eye, okay? There's 14 muscles. 12 are involved in tracking a ball. So these 12 muscles, this goes back to your initial questions about perception and, and all those things, is where these eyes are aiming, uh, kind of like gun turrets in a sense of how these things are are moving and tracking on there. And honestly, um, you know, I've been evaluating athletes for 20 some odd years, my dad for 50 some odd years when he started in the 70s. And, you know, great players that have great timing that are, you know, hit above average, hit very well, consistent, have great dynamic depth perception. And it has to do with how the brain uses both eyes and how the muscles track and move and how the brain takes in the visual information from each eye. So our, our 3D depth perception tracking trainer, that's the tool that we utilize these guys from a training standpoint to get those eyes to work a lot better, to get the brain to pay attention to the two eyes for tracking purposes, focus part. So there's kind of stages in their training that they're one working these eye muscles out, just like you're training any other muscle and you're getting them to work more efficiently. Not necessarily, they're not going to get big and bulky and strong. They're getting more like yoga, more control of your eye movements. And um, so that's one stage. And then the other stage is what you asked about is what they use in the on deck circle or pregame, postgame, uh, during game, during the week how they improve their focus by doing these drills. So there's kind of different stages within that depth perception training, but the main goal is to train the muscles of the eyes for tracking purposes. You mentioned the amygdala earlier, and I was doing some research earlier this week on just on breathing and how, you know, breathing through your nose versus your mouth and how that affects the amygdala. Um, is that something that you go into as well with players? I know, I know the eyes are part of the brain. I mean, and this is very complex stuff. I don't mean to simplify it in any shape, shape or form. Cause I know this is, I mean, it can get very deep and, and messy as I'm sure, you know, yeah. um, but is, is breathing, is that part of 
uh, um, can that help your vision too? Well, so here, here's the simplistic way of saying it. Calm eyes are better eyes. Okay. So how you get your eyes calm can be multiple different reason, ways, right? Um, and, you know, we could argue probably that, you know, it could be a tightening of the muscles. It could be in the loosening of the muscles. It could be a visualization. It could be a breathing. It could be, um, you know, again, touch your nose, touch your shoulder, touch your toes. And all of a sudden that creates calmness. Whatever creates calmness is the right answer. And, you know, that's what everyone wants to get is, again, uh, you know, bringing this up is that calm, focused, confident state. And, you know, you want something that's real, that's not false on there. And when I say false, it's not a, you know, a, a gimmick that's not going to work all the, t- you know, I, I should say not work all the time, but, you know, there's gimmicks out there that claim they're going to do this and that, and you just kind of go, okay, sure. But, you know, having a method and not just one, it needs to be two or three or, or four methods to get you in that calm focused state. So does deep breathing get you in there? Sure. It, it can get you in there. Um, is it for everyone? I don't think it is. I don't, I think some guys, you know, if, if you kind of go at it a little different is think about a heartbeat and think about energy level. Some guys need to run at a high level and some guys need to, to run at a cool, calm level on there. So breathing could get you in a state, but it can also get you out of a state. So trying to find that state that you're optimal in and finding a way to get there is key on there. And some guys need that fear to go. Some guys need the calmness to go. Uh, Everyone's a little bit different, but, you know, even as I bounce around here, when it comes down to it, uh, they want to be in that calm focus state. What that calm focus state is may be different for each individual. Mm, great point. Yeah, it, it does. It, it's kind of like there's kind of an, an art to it, which is interesting because um, it is a science too. I don't know. It's kind of weird. I guess this whole hitting thing is just so messy. It's so it's so hard. It seems like uh, you know vision is you know there's obviously science behind it, but you bring up some really good points when you're you know just referring to everyone is a little bit different. And I think, you know, reading research papers and things like that, I think at times can make it seem as if it's just one optimal way for everybody. And so it's, it's reassuring uh, to, um, to hear you say, Hey, I've worked with elite, uh, the elites of the elites. And there's some that, Hey, like, I know that study says that, but it doesn't mean it's the best for everybody. So I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think you, you know, you bring it up there as an art and a science and you're right. It is. Uh, if there was one way of doing it, we'd all be doing it. And, um, you know, understanding, you know, the person is key, but also understanding what they need to do to perform at a high level. And, you know, kind of asking this question, and I want you to think about this and everyone who's listening to this, and it doesn't matter if it's baseball, it could be work, it could be whatever it is. When you're at your best, what are you thinking about? And the answer that most people are going to say is not much, just in that flow, right? When you're struggling, what are you thinking about? Mechanics. And the answer usually is, yeah, mechanics, everything, what dad's going to say, what mom's going to say, coach is mad at me, whatever. It could be lots of stuff that goes on spinning our brain. And even from a physical standpoint, when we're at our best, how do you feel? And most people say they don't feel much. It's just smooth and clear and everything like that. And then when they struggle, how do you feel? And they all say, oh, I feel slow. I feel, you know, mechanical. I feel, you know, just not right on there. And then kind of this third part to it is when they're at their best, how well do they see things? And they're in that flow. They're just picking up the details and they're reacting to it. And when they're struggling, you know, it's, take from a hitting is it looks like a golf ball. So when people perform at their best, again, no matter what it is, is they see things really well. They don't think about much and they don't feel much. And I, I strongly, and I'm sure people will not like me saying this, but one of the problems in baseball, we're so worried about feel all the time. And if we're searching for feel, we're never seeing and we're never, you know, lost. We're not clearing our mind. We're so focused on the wrong stuff. Now, sometimes when we feel right, that kind of clears our mind and, and gets us on task. But it, but I think it's a backwards way of thinking. Uh, a lot of times is worrying about feel because most athletes don't feel when they're at their best. And this, again, not just baseball, every sport. In your experience, how have you 
helped players or what have been maybe some examples of how you've been able to help players get from that thinking about everything back to that state of just focusing on the bowl and like not you kind of getting back in that flow state as you said yeah i i think i give them a lot of ideas of how to ask the right questions to themselves of how well they're seeing the ball not if they're seeing the ball or not but how well are they seeing the ball and if you're not seeing it like you're capable of if you're not seeing it like when you have the take sign um what do you need to do to get there and is it because you're thinking about mechanics? Is it because you're worried about results? Is it because you're focused on the, you know, what you're doing after the game, uh, which happens a lot. It's easy for our brain to creep into other stuff. So giving them the tools, which the 3D helps, uh, there's a couple other tools, getting them to understand how how they see the ball and how they can get back to seeing the ball like they like, they like to. So I think that's the key. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot from my father in doing that. And it seems sometimes I think it's simple. And, and then other times I know how complex it is to be able to do that. And it's more than just, hey, look at the ball. Yeah. Wh what's um, what's been, what's the most impactful thing that you learned from your dad from for sports vision? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> the most impactful thing. Um. I, I, you know, that's a hard one for me to answer. And the reason it is, is I, I'm very lucky that I learned from the best. And, you know, I, I was always asking him questions, always challenging him. Uh, sometimes, you know, the challenges were right on my side of things. But I think the, the biggest thing probably is it's not about me. It's about the athlete and what the athlete needs to do to succeed on there. And trying to get them to be their the, their best version of themselves um, through vision uh, is probably the most impactful thing that we that I learned. It's good stuff. Yeah, I I can definitely see that coming through. Where you're not, it's not your way or the highway. I mean, you know, you've said multiple times, well, it's like it could be this or it could be this. You know, it's so it's um I can definitely already see that. That's definitely yeah, it, I mean, And let me, you know, there's some absolutes about vision. There's ways your vision works good for you. And there's a way your vision works bad for you. And I know there's some things out there that people say, um, you know, whether it's on Twitter or whether, you know, speakers or whatever it is. And there's a lot of misinformation out there on how the eyes function uh, best. And, you know, but at the end of the day, if the wrong answer, the right answer makes you succeed consistently, then who cares on there that's what, what it be, comes down to what's an example of of misinformation well i think uh the, the biggest uh, there's quite a few but i think one of the biggest things is the importance of trying to see the ball as deep as you can uh a lot of people uh think you can't do it um and because of a study because it was written in a book in the in the uh many years ago also because of eye tracking devices and eye tracking devices don't work in baseball. Uh, they're they're not fast enough. They don't work under the lighting conditions. Someday they may work phenomenal, but they do not work at 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 this level of sport on there. Um, now there's some information that can be drawn from it, but the way that the eyes, you know, trying to see the ball deep, is our. I'm trying to simplify this a little bit. Um, our recognition skills are based off past experiences. And if we stop watching the ball at 15 feet, uh, six feet, five feet, three feet, eight feet, whatever that distance is, we're missing a lot of valuable information. For one, as a hitter, that's where the pitch wants the ball, pitcher wants the ball to break. Second, uh, visual memory is a big deal. The more I see and take, the more I can use that information for better earlier recognition down the road. And then the other thing that people don't know, know is, um, I mean, if you look at other sports like, say, golf, for example, when you see them hit the ball, they don't look up. They try to keep their eyes as deep as possible after contact. And same thing should be done, worked on, and in baseball. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't really matter if you see the ball hit the bat or not. Your brain can see things at a very high rate. It doesn't mean we can always verbalize it or we can always interpret it or even understand what, what our brain sees. But our brain can take in that information at a very high rate. And are also, uh, as I ramble in here, this is another kind of misunderstanding about seeing it deep is 
we have a, a small area of clarity. And then we see um, a shape, then we see color, then we see motion. And so what happens with a lot of people is they're reacting to the motion of what they see or the color, but they're not seeing the shape and they're not seeing the detail. So what happens if we don't track it as long as we possibly can, uh, and again, I'm not saying that you're going to see hit the bat or not, as long as you can, you're missing some of that valuable information for decision making for the future as well as at that time. So I know it's an argument that that I don't like to go down with a lot of people because they don't understand the system in, in general, but we, as a hitter, you have to see the ball as long as possible. If it's if you see it an inch longer, it's better than not. We got to learn how to see it longer, see it early, see it deep is key for these for these athletes. So I think sometimes people talking about that deep part is a mis, misunderstanding of vision. So they're they're essentially saying that you can't see it past a certain point. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. When it comes to, you know, you can talk to players that will say they saw it hit the bat and you can say players have never seen it hit the bat. I'm not going to call them a liar. Right. You know, yeah. if they, yeah. if they think they saw it hit the bat, I, I'm all for it. Right. But great hitters tend to have their eyes closer as deep as possible uh, to the action. And so it's just something that should be, there's no, let me put it in, in another way. There's no value that I understand of not trying to watch the ball as long as possible. You're not benefiting. And part of it is, and this is fielding too, is the way our eyes want to work is they love motion. They love distraction. They, When they think they're done with a the task, they want to move on to the next thing. So as an example, as you grab a drink or you grab the door handle, you grab it and you want to look away. So if we train our eyes to look away, we tend to come off a little bit earlier than we want, we mean to, and we miss a lot of valuable information. So I, I think it's something that we need to counter and we need to work on as hitters. I, I want to ask you a little bit about pitch recognition. And I know I was, I know I had you coming on the podcast tonight. So I was talking to a few players earlier today and I was asking them, I sent them a picture of from a behind home plate view and, and, and I just said like, Hey, like, what are you looking at? And some of the answers, they honestly couldn't really tell, like, tell, like, some are like, I think I look at the hat and then the release point. Like, they really didn't know. Um, how many yeah. players you work with don't actually know what they're looking at? Uh, surprisingly, a huge, huge amount. And, and that's what makes this thing amazing is them not knowing where their eyes are at and still being successful. It's pretty incredible, right? Yeah. Now, think about if they knew what they were looking at and how they were taking the information in. And, you know, you can kind of put this in other terms. Let's say it's sniper, right? That makes sense. Or a, or a, a uh, archer. If they weren't looking at the target um, for a certain amount of time, now there's some bad parts to that we'll get into, but if they weren't picking their target <laughs> up, um, you know, they're going to miss more than they make, right? Now, unless they have some incredible other skill set that can be there. So, you know, it, it still amazes me um, for, for many things when and you bring up pitch recognition is, first of all, they have no clue where they're looking. They think they're looking somewhere. And and when you say they, you know, again, when they think, are they doing that on every pitch? And they have no idea. And then what happens is, you know, when they struggle, they search for a lot of other stuff and they still can't hit and then they give up and they decide to look for the ball and they start hitting the ball again right and so think about if they had a good method um and maybe a varying method but a good method of how to pick the ball up out of the release point um they would probably be in a better situation more uh, be a more consistent hitter what are some examples of what players are looking at for the player like that you've that you've worked with and and these players like actually know what they're they're specifically looking for something like i'm sure there's yeah. different like is there some players where it's hey um um it's a soft gaze if you will or fixed fixed like point in the arm like what are some examples that you've seen work for players who had some type of system well you know let me uh let me 
turn this back on you a little yeah. bit. Okay. What's the most important thing in baseball that they have to focus on? The ball, seeing the ball. The ball, right? Right. Okay. It's not the mechanics. It's not who's thrown. It's not how many outs. It's not all this. It's the ball. So first, the first thing that they have to get better at, where's the ball being released from? And, you know, a lot of them have no idea um, or that, you know, even watching video, they just kind of look at it and they see the whole picture, but they're never looking. If we had good eye tracking and when we do for video um, is knowing are their eyes right on this release point at the right time? To me, that's what what hitters don't do enough of if working on getting there. Now, look, if you get here too early, you're going to be in trouble. Okay. And if you're there too late, you're going to be in trouble. This is what timing is, right? Timing begins with where your eyes are at and, and what you're seeing and what you're perceiving on there. And so finding that right timing of getting their eyes there is right. Now, I can make you close your eyes and I can say, open them. And if your eyes are aimed right there and ready to be engaged right at that moment, you're going to see the ball friggin' incredible. Okay. You're going to see it as early as you can. And it's going to be great. Now, if I told you to close your eyes and I open them up late, you're going to react and, and get jumpy because it's on you before you know it. And if I got you there too early, you're going to start leaning forward a little bit more. So finding that right timing of getting here is, is the what has to be worked on. Now, how you get here could be multiple ways. Now, there is some ways how your eyes function best. Is it the way to do it? Um, yes, it is. But is it for everyone? No, because some guys, you know, everyone's brain's different and they may not be able to handle certain things uh, or understand or put in, even if they understood, they may not be able to put it into play very efficiently. Could be because of eye function, could be a focus function, could be a lot of things. Now, you bring up this idea of soft focus and, and, and stuff, and we talk about soft, fine and hard. And um, what people don't really understand, because there's a few things out there uh floating around people love this soft focus because it's relaxing i get it uh, you know it, there's some valuable valuable ways of being in a soft focus or a panorama focus or a broad focus or however you want want to say it um but it's hard to perform in that soft focus our body does not perform very well in that soft focus we get it's easy to daydream get lost in thought now if we find focus that's looking for detail okay but we can only find focus for a short amount of time. What happens if we focus too long on a, on a small spot, we get into what we call hard focus. And a hard focus is very stiff and, and we don't react very well. And you see a lot of hitters that way that get into a hard focus where they're staring right at the pitcher. They may not know what they're looking at, but they're staring right out at the pitcher and then they can't move on there. Fine focus is looking for the slight information, looking for detail. And, it, it's a finite time, and that's what we're trying to do is look finite on the ball in a fine focus at the right time. We can't be here too long because if we're generally looking, it becomes soft, and then we see this motion go through, and we don't see the detail on there. So learning how to move your eyes to get them right there is the right thing to do. And, you know, there's some things that um, – <laughs> I, I I laugh because I've heard a lot of different things from different players and some of them think it's great and look, it works for them, but they don't know that it couldn't be better because they've never tried anything that's better. They only know what they know. So if, if it works for them and they're confident in it, maybe they shouldn't change anything, but if they want to get better at it, there might be a better or more consistent. There may be a better consistent pattern that they're not using to get to that spot. But do you need to do it every time? Maybe not. Maybe when you're struggling, you need to have the, your patterns in there. So, um, you know, just like even when it comes to clarity, people don't know they can see better until they put contact lenses on. Then all of a sudden it's like everything's sharp. So if we don't know that we can do this or experiment, so part of it is spending time on, on you know, um, trying different methods, finding what works. I had a player the other day, uh, a high uh, forty-man roster guy, and um, he's got he's had some struggles, he's had some success, and we were doing some things on on learn how to switch at the right time, and he he went, oh my goodness, was his response because he's never never he forgot that that's how he wants to see the ball more consistently, but he never knew how to get back to that, 
because he fell into it before. So every player, whether they're a high school player, whether it's it's a major leaguer, they should learn a pattern or learn some methods, just like you're talking about the on-deck circle earlier. I mean, I have my bias of how it should be, but they need to find a way to learn how to pick that ball up out of the release point as efficiently as they can. What's your bias? What's my bias? Yeah. So um, remember how we just said a little while ago about uh, EMDR? Yeah. So that has to do with eye movement, desensitization. So your eyes are moving, right? Yeah. So learning how to move your eyes so you're not thinking and getting them to switch to this area at the right time. So it depends on the release point. If the release point is up here, mm. probably something up, up in this range on this person. If it's down side, probably around the waist that you need to look at. And moving over. Your oh, so you're thinking better. side to side when they're in the box. Your eyes move better side to side than up and down. It's how they're designed. So if you're kind of looking far to near, you got some depth issues. So you want to stay on the same plane of reference. Learning how to get move your eyes in the same plane of reference is, is key. And you said that that's also research into that about that uh, decreases how um the amygdala is working as well yeah thinking fear yeah you're gonna send me down a rabbit hole later tonight <laughs> no it's fun uh i mean i i you know look you, you you bring up a good point that most hitters if and maybe this answers your first question probably as a coach and a team how do you get what these guys perceive Getting your players up there and go, what are you looking at when the pitcher's on the mound? Mm -hmm. What are you looking at when he steps? What are you looking at when he when he turns? What happens when his hands break? Where where do you think the release point's going to be on this guy? You know, giving them, you know, thinking of it a little bit backwards, but you know, again, I, I I'm big on learning how to see it early, but also learning how to see it deep. That gives us the most amount of time to make decisions. So finding that that way of being calm, focused, right at the target, which is the ball at the right time, is the key component to it. Do some guys fall into it? Yes. So some guys don't do it and still get hit. Sure. Guys who tend to be more consistent have some kind of method that they get to, whether it's you know my method, someone else's method, whatever it is, they have a method of getting uh, being in a heightened visual awareness. Who is the best hitter you've ever tested? The best hitter. Um, well, I didn't test him, but I mean, this is the no brainer, but it is Barry Bonds. Um, my dad tested Barry when he was a triple A player. Uh, I got video of the two of them talking back in triple A before he made it to the big leagues talking about vision. Um, Barry, and I want you to understand something. Uh, I look at vision as three aspects. One is the medical, which is kind of the, the clarity. Two is the skill sets, which is depth perception, dynamic depth perception, visual memory, visual processing skills. And the third is the tactics, how you use them on the field. Okay. So when you talk about the best vision, you know, we're talking about somebody who's got all three on there. Um, and he's definitely one that has that. There are certain guys who are very successful, have very good skills, um, and that helps them. And there are certain guys that have very good tactics and decent skills um, it, that help them, and clarity too. They're all they're all a combination. Now, more of a, the current players uh, probably don't really want to say some of those guys, but there are some guys that have some, you know. <laughs> I, it, here's the easiest way to say it. You, the guys that have high contact rates probably have the better vision mm -hmm. on their visual mm -hmm. skills. And I can tell you that in the career, if you look at the the hitters that hit 300 and above, which is only like, I want to say it's less than 200 players that have ever done that. Um, and I haven't tested all of them, but we've tested a fair amount of them. I'd say uh, there's probably... Uh, 50 of them that we tested and probably 40 of them that have high level visual skills on there. Skills, visual skills. Yeah. Now there are guys who weren't great hitters that have good visual skills because they see everything like a beach ball 
and they swing at everything. They just didn't have any control. They, everything looks good to them, so they just swing on there. So they had no visual discipline on there. And then there's guys that had average visual skills but have very good visual discipline and can put it into play. So of those 40, you said 40 out of 50 hitters that had good vis- get, um, good skill, how many of those, I know this is something we touched a little bit on earlier, how many of those knew what they were looking at? In the sense of like, hey, when the pitcher does this, this is where my eyes are at. They and then all, it goes. Honestly, they probably all had a visual plan. None all of them, them did it by accident. All of them. Yes. Okay. I, I would I mean, I'd have to look at that list, but the ones that come to my mind from the from great, you know, whether it's Barry, whether it's, you know, I bring up Sean Casey all the time, whether it was George Brett, whether uh, you know, those guys all, you know, Rod Carew, you know, um, all a lot of those guys um, had good visual plans of, of attack. Even there's players I haven't worked with or met and stuff. And, you know, I've heard from different guys like uh, Ichiro, supposedly, you know, his visual plan. I'm not sure what he ended up hitting, but I know he was a great contact hitter. Um, you know, he had a very good visual plan. That, so uh, I don't know them all, but I'd say a majority of them had good visual plans. Do you find that in the last, I don't know, five years or so, more players, coaches, people in general are are looking for vi- looking to vision as a as a as another way to get better? I mean, I feel like it's something that it's not sexy like mechanics. Like I could go on Twitter and put a video out and just draw a bunch of random lines on a player and it goes viral, right? Which <laughs> and it doesn't really do anything, honestly. But like we talk about like the vision, the mental side of the game, the thing, the stuff that actually moves the needle i think for players yeah. has that set something that you've seen people have really reached out and, and wanted more information on unfortunately not as much um really? as i would like to say because you know we've been doing this for a long time my dad started in the 70s start with kansas city world's baseball academy and um they were doing things back then that were groundbreaking even when it came to fitness they were doing things that weren't d- done in the other place and um, there was a lot of success by guys, including, uh, uh, by the way, Ron Washington was a product of that Royals baseball academy. He's 16 years old. He was there. And uh, in fact, talked to him recently about that. And um, the the thing is, Vision's always been kind of the quiet um, secret sauce for some of these players, stuff that they don't talk about. But I'll tell you one thing. When, when you talk to players who are very consistent and do things at a high level, have these good visual skills. I always ask a question to them. Do your teammates think you're crazy? And they're all say, yeah, because <laughs> the, they, because they see things differently and they talk about things differently. And these other players just don't get it because they take, you take vision for granted because it's not something that's an, analyzed very easily or understood. Even when you talk about optometry, um, you know, they're not great at performance vision, sports vision. They're good at vision, but not performance vision and how it relates to the sport on there. And, you know, I, I will take some blame that my father uh, never really educated a lot of people on what he did. Uh, he was very gifted in what he did. And he was the secret sauce for a lot of these teams and and and, and stuff. And still the same thing. I don't, I get players saying, I, this is so good. I don't want to tell anyone else, right? Yeah. Now there are a few players that are more out there to tell it to, but people think they see the ball good. They just, when you say, did you see the ball? You're, they're going to say, yeah, I saw the ball, but it doesn't mean much to us. What they got to learn is, you know, a method. And, and when they do ask the questions and when they do want to find out what guys are doing, when they, when they have tried every mechanical fix in the world that they, they see and read, they're all looking for that next edge and look and and the, the nice thing about vision, it's not like, well, I, I should, I mean, at the upper level, these guys are looking for small gains and they know that this is such an impactful thing. If they could see the ball better, more, more times, they're going to give a chance. Now, why do people not ask the question? Um, because of technology, because of, uh, you know, it's easier to work on the swing. Um, you know, even psychology, you know, people struggle with that and they're getting better at it these days, but it was so hard for many years until really the last 10 years that people start asking those questions. But um, I do think that um, even when it comes to professional players and or uh, organizations, they are starting to ask the questions more again, because they've gone through all this other technology boom that they're going through. 
The problem is they all want the one pill uh, fix. You know, how can you tell me that this player is going to be the next Barry Bonds? You know, how how are you going to get this guy to do this? And, you know, vision is, it, it's like I said, it's simple, but it's very complex. And it's not a, a one-way approach. And it's not a, uh, um, you know, a software approach that if you do the software training, you're going to be great. Or if you're going to do this touch board, you're going to be great. Or if you're going to wear these VR glasses, you're going to be able to hit a thousand on there. Uh, it's more to it than just this one answer. And it's not sexy, right? It's not sexy. And when I do training sessions, we get guys half hour sessions. We get them an hour training session. I get guys that come in and we'll do four or five hours a day for two or three days um, because they come in for a weekend and they're overwhelmed by the end because they can't believe all this stuff, but it all makes sense to them, but they've never been taught that because it's not something that's sexy. And, you know, guys want to swing. They want to lift. They want to sweat. We don't sweat when we work our eyes, unfortunately. Yeah. You have plenty of time to sweat if you're running around the bases because your vision's so good. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What, um, where do you see, this going in the next five to 10 years? Like, where do you see uh, sports vision? Where do you, I mean, is there technology out there that you're optimistic that will help players vision get to another level? Or like, I'm just kind of curious, like, obviously I'm in more of the hitting side of things. And so there's different things going on that maybe five to 10 years could be around, but yeah. is there anything you have on the vision side do you think will be here? Well, I, I, it's a, it's a good question. Um, Yes, I, I do know there's some things, um, even education will start coming around a little bit better in it. But again, you know, from a baseball standpoint and really talking from a hitter standpoint, even though it applies to pitching and applies to fielding as well, but we all like to see the hitting games, right? We like to see what the advancement is, is hitting. And, um, you know, even for you or for any hitting instructor, and this is, again, kind of goes back to what you, you're trying to fix a swing or you're trying to build a swing however you want to you know write this this situation is and i think it's important i think guys need to get stronger i think guys need to swing the bat right and i think they need to learn what they can and can't do with the bat but if you don't know how they see or how they're they're picking the ball up or what they're looking at i'm not sure i i know you're making gains with the swing but I'm not sure you're making as good a gains as you should be making with that. And, and what I mean by that, look, if, you know, this is kind of, joke, if the guy is thinking about what you're telling him as the pitch is coming in, are we doing the right thing for them? Okay. Um, if he's worried about what mom's going to yell at him, at, you know, when he gets out of the cage and not paying attention, is he really focused on the ball where he doesn't even care what the ball's doing? And so I think in the future, at some point, and this is probably long term, eye tracking will be there to be good. And I do know there was a company, they went defunct, it had nothing to do with sports, but they were trying to develop contact lenses that had eye tracking devices built in the contact lenses. Some point, I'm sure that's going to happen. I think AR is really where um, the technology is going to be more than VR, augmented reality. Um, I think, um, but I don't know. The problem is the cost of the technology right now for that level of baseball player is probably too high. Now, the 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 immediate interest, and this is a little bit of my perspective. Um, I have an instrument that I'm the only one in sports that has it, so I'm, I'm lucky to that. But it's going to be out there in the future that actually measures uh, ocular metrics at a high level. Now, there are other machines out there that measure ocular metrics, but they're not very consistent in, in their measurements. And what ocular metrics means is really about knowing how quick the eyes move, how well they track a moving object and things like that. So it's not necessarily we're doing it in this baseball world. We're trying to see how the eye moves, how the muscles move. And that gives me a lot of information, but it would give other people information because it's going to be available on a headset in the, in the near future. Um that you can kind of go, okay, this guy's got slow eyes. This guy's got fast eyes. This guy's got, you know, his his visual accuracy of tracking is, is really tight or it's inconsistent. Now we can train those 
or we can go, I take that information. Now I build that hitter based off knowing this is how he sees on there. Mm. That's interesting. So for somebody like myself, like, let's say, you know, you, you, you know, some of that information, I mean, am I just getting as creative as I possibly can knowing, you know what I mean? Like, how am I, how would I go about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, I, I wish I had a simple answer for you. And, um, you know, it took me many, many years to learn what I learned. Uh, it wasn't an overnight thing that I learned from my dad to be able to apply to athletes, but there are some simple things that can be learned overnight. And, um, there are simple tools that we have that we utilize. Uh, I call it the eye track. Some people call it a Brock string, but it's, it's learning how to use it. Right. Not just, Oh, this is a cool tool. What does that mean? And how does it apply to my hitters? Um, obviously you, you mentioned the depth perception training, that those are skills that can be trained. They're designed for the player itself. But coaches can learn and, and encourage players to get their eyes better. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of requests for doing uh, coaching training, and I have not done them yet. Uh, there are some things that have held me back for reasons for it. And there may be some things coming down the road that um, we might be able to pull those off a little bit better. So, um, you know, doing some courses, I, I'm not a big thing about, I don't want, um, I'm not a big deal with certification in a sense because uh, I think it gets watered down, but but education is, is key so that coaches can understand, you know, what hitters are doing or what they're not doing. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It's been awesome. On Where can that, people um, – go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say, but on top of that, every kid should have their eyes checked too. So right. they should be going to the local doctor. But don't – But and I want to add this. This is all players. When they go to the local doctor, they want to try to pass – they don't like to be told that they can't see, but as a baseball player, they should be going, what's the best vision that I can have for baseball? Not, you know, best, you know, just so I can go to school, but what can I do to see the ball better as a baseball player? And some doctors may not have that answer, but we go to the doctor wanting to pass every test and, oh yeah, I can see that. But, you know, even for, you know, for me, as I get older, there's some letters I'm like, mm, yeah, I, give me a second. I got it. Right. That's not going to work for baseball. I got to be able to go, got it on there. So getting your eyes to be the best, not just I can see, but see real well. Yeah, I, I'm guilty of doing that as well, too, when I go to the eye doctor. <laughs> I want to wear glasses. I don't want to wear contacts. I don't want to put anything in my eyes. But, you know, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Get, baseball players want the best bat, right? They want the best shoes. They want the best batting glove of all things. Why wouldn't you want the best eyes? Good point. It's a good point. Where um where can people contact you? I know you said you're not doing um you know you haven't been able to maybe like travel as much as of late for doing coaching stuff, but where where's the best ways for for people to find you or, or get a hold of you? Um, probably the best is uh you know again obviously the social media is at slow the game down website slow the game down dot com uh you know my contact information's there my cell phone's on there too people can reach out to me. Uh, not always the quickest to re in response, but I try to respond in somewhat a timely manner. But, you know, you can reach out. And uh, we're in Southern California and Irvine, California. We have a facility there. Um, so I get coaches that do stop by, especially when they're recruiting on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Sorry. Um, and then um, uh, I got players that come in and out of there, too. Uh, there. So we do training, uh, in-person training there. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on today, Ryan. Yep. Appreciate it. Thanks. For